Good afternoon and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens, our webinar series that we bring experts to your uh, residence, uh, to your office, and share information with you that maybe you haven't thought about before. We hope you pick up some information and it helps you in your adventures with gardening and the natural world. Today, our presentation is given by Dr. Yamina Pressler. She is a very special person in a very special project and we're going to show images at the end of her presentation as where you can see her in the Smithsonian Gardens if you come and visit us. But as always, put your questions in the chat box We'll be glad to answer them at the end of the presentation. So I'm Cindy Brown, manager of Smithsonian Gardens Education and Collection, and it is a great honor to welcome Dr. Pressler with us today. And if you would go ahead and start us off, tell us more about yourself, how you got involved in this project, how you got involved in soils. I've already shared how, uh, how much I, I appreciate soils and appreciate learning about them. But tell us how you got into this great field and what you hope we all learn about soils in this presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and disappear. I'll see you in just a bit. Thank you so much for the invitation. I am so incredibly happy to be here. I appreciate all of you showing up today to celebrate soil with me and with us as a community. I am Dr. Yumina Pressler. I am a soil scientist and ecologist at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I'm also an educator and an absolute enthusiast of all things soil. And today, what I wanna talk about is bring you a little bit on a journey of exploring the wonder of soil, both through a scientific lens and also through an artistic lens. I feel like I stumbled upon soil very early on in my career, and I feel really lucky to have done so because before I learned about soil in a formal class, I didn't know a whole lot about it. And I have spent the last many years of my career being fascinated by all of the wonders that exist below ground. And I'm so happy to be able to share that with you today. And so when many of us think about soil, I think this is one of the pictures that comes in our mind. Soil is this medium for plant growth. It is this fundamental thing that supports life on earth. And I know that many of you are gardeners and interested in spending time in the out of doors, tending to your gardens. And soil is this important medium to be able to make that happen. And before I started learning about soils, this is kind of the picture that I had in my mind. I thought that soil was just this pile of brown stuff outside that supported plants. I hadn't really thought a whole lot about it. But it wasn't until I took a soils class and I learned from some very enthusiastic soil scientists that soils are this precious natural resource and also a really beautiful natural wonder. And I have spent so much of my life trying to unpack the secrets that exist within the soil. And so when I look at soil as a soil scientist, I see something a little bit more like this, where soils are colorful and diverse. They come in many different shapes and forms, and they exist continuously, both down within the depths from the surface of the soil and also across landscapes. And it is this diversity that I want to share with you today. But I think first we want to think a little bit about what even is soil. Yes, soil is a medium for plant growth, but soils really serve as this environmental interface. Soils are at the nexus of the atmosphere, the biosphere, the geosphere, and the hydrosphere. They integrate between the weathering of rocks and minerals, the movement of water down through the soil and across landscapes. They provide support for the plants growing above and they connect really directly with the atmosphere. And so soils are really at the center of, of so much that happens out in the natural world. And as soil scientists, we're interested in understanding all of those interrelationships between soil and everything else that it is connected with. 
one of my favorite definitions of soil is that soil is the ecstatic skin of the earth or the ecstatic layer of the earth's surface. It is the biologically excited layer of the earth that is right, the connection between the geosphere and the biosphere and what's happening above. And it is because of this integrative nature of soils that they are able to provide and support these fundamental ecosystem services without which life on this planet would be completely different. It is soils that provide, of course, a medium for plant growth, like I've mentioned, that supports our agriculture, that supports our hobbies like gardening, that supports all of the natural ecosystems that are existing on the planet through their ability to filter water and cycle nutrients and regulate our climate, soils provide these ecosystem services that we rely on and without which life on this planet wouldn't exist. There are even some other ecosystem services that we maybe don't think a whole lot about. Soils preserve our cultural heritage. They also are often the source of pharmaceutical or genetic resources. They serve as infrastructure for humans. They quite literally underlie almost everything that we do. And they provide habitat for the huge biodiversity that exists on the planet. And I know that many of you are so excited about exploring this plant biodiversity and soils have the ability to do that. The diversity of different kinds of soils that I'm gonna talk about today really underlie the diversity that we see above ground and soils support plant biodiversity all around the world. From the most colorful and charismatic plants to the everyday plants that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. Soils also support a huge amount of below ground biodiversity. These are some of what I call my microbial and faunal friends. Soils host a perplexing biodiversity below ground. It's estimated that we've actually only characterized about 1% of the biodiversity within the soil. That is mind boggling to me. And the organisms that live within the soil, they range from the very familiar, like the earthworm or ants, to the less familiar, like the nematodes and tardigrades and uh, the bacteria and fungi. These organisms range across lots of different scales in size from the very tiny single-celled organisms to the larger organisms like a burrowing owl, which I am still looking for in my birding adventures out around my local ecosystems. There are so many different kinds of soil organisms and this biodiversity, I think in and of itself is something that makes soils really special. This life, the fact that soils are living and dynamic places is something that makes soil what it is. And it's the interactions of these very organisms that give rise to these ecosystem services that soils provide. So all of these soil organisms from the fungi that are in symbiosis with plant roots to bacteria that are decomposing organic matter to nematodes that exist in the little water films around soils to the arthropods that are walking in air filled pore spaces. All of this biodiversity interacts with one another in complex soil food webs, just like we have complex food webs in above ground ecosystems as well. And those interactions, not just one organism itself, but the interaction between many organisms gives rise to important ecosystem processes. Things like decomposition and the recycling of nutrients that helps of course sustain plant growth. These organisms also contribute to the all important soil organic matter formation. And that organic matter is often considered the basis of soil fertility and helps soil support many of the ecosystem services that I've already mentioned. And so soils as an entity are so much more than just a pile of stuff that exists outside. They are living and dynamic systems that change over time. And they're also subject to degradation and many of these environmental challenges that we're facing right now. As we all know, society is facing unprecedented environmental challenges due to land degradation, the loss of ecosystem services, climate change, and so on. And because soils sit at the nexus, at the center of so many of these parts of the Earth system, I see them as being really key to finding solutions 
to some of these grand environmental challenges. If we want to understand how to feed our global populations in the years and, and decades to come, we need to know something about managing our soils. If we want to maintain this biodiversity both above and below ground, soils are part of that puzzle. If we want to understand how we can manage and mitigate drought and water storage and water quality, soils are a big piece of that puzzle. And so as you start to think about how we can approach these environmental challenges, soils come up again and again and again, yet we often don't think about and talk about soils as much given, given their importance in the natural world. Soils are this really important natural resource. They provide these fundamental ecosystem services. But from my view, soils are also a beautiful natural wonder. They are part of nature that is colorful and complex and diverse. And they exist in beautiful forms that I want to explore today. And that biodiversity, all of those different kinds of organisms that live within the soil contribute to soil being a natural wonder. And so I think it's really important for us to think of soils not just as a natural resource of something that uh, provides services to us as humans, but also as this intrinsic part of nature, as a natural wonder that I think is worth celebrating. And at least from my own experience, I, I came to study soils because I was surprised how colorful and diverse and complex and beautiful they are. I, it, it wasn't until later that I learned how fundamentally important the soils are for so many different processes that happen on earth and how sensitive they can be to our management and environmental changes that I really became uh, interested in studying that a lot more. But the thing that hooked me in the beginning was the color. And I'm going to tell you about how I have come back to this interest or even obsession with soil color in the years since through some of my artwork. And so I really do think that in order to conserve soils into the future, the first thing that we need to be able to do is see them, see them in our daily lives. I often talk about how if we want to stop treating soils like dirt, we first need to develop the eyes to be able to see them. Soils are everywhere. They surround us all the time. And because of that, it's so easy for soils to be overlooked. And many of us haven't been shown soils out in our natural spaces. And so what I wanna to do today is give you some tools to be able to look for soils in your daily lives so that you can start to develop some curiosity about how they formed, how they might function and how they change in the future. This is me, a photo of me out on a run, always stopping and looking for a soil, no matter where I am out in the world. Soils are dynamic, complex, and diverse systems. This is something that I have already said, and I want to explain why that is. Why are there so many different kinds of soils? Soils are more than just one homogenous thing. Soils are living, complex, dynamic ecosystems that, like I mentioned, arrive from interactions of lots of different organisms and rocks and minerals and all of that diversity within the Earth system creates these different kinds of soils that we see. And so soil scientists have put together a framework for understanding why there are so many different kinds of soils. And to answer that question, we can think about an equation. This equation here with artwork by Louis Fausak shows soil on one side is a function of several different factors. We call these the soil forming factors. And those are the climate that that soil is forming in, the kinds of organisms, both plants and organisms living within the soil, the topography, where a soil is on a slope, is it at the top of the hill, on a back slope, at the bottom of the hill, is it in a floodplain, is it close to the coast, is it inland, all of those things influence how a soil forms. And the next one is the kind of parent material. What is the original rock? What kinds of minerals are within that rock that are weathering to become the material that soils form within? And how long has that soil been there? The age of the soil or the amount of time that soils have formed. And so to answer this question of why are there so many different kinds of soils in the world and, and how is it that soils are able to provide all of these ecosystem services, we have to look at these soil forming factors. And all of these factors interact with one another 
to create an almost endless, seemingly endless diversity of different kinds of soil types. And so if you look uh, in your own life, maybe you have spent some time in the East Coast, maybe you have spent some time elsewhere in the world, you may have noticed that the properties of the soil differ depending on where you are. You may have also noticed that properties of soil differ depending on what kind of plants are growing at the surface. If you're in a grassland, like the soil behind me on my Zoom background, or if you're in a forest, the properties and characteristics of those soils differ. And of course, the earth system is full of lots of different kinds of rocks that weather into a great diversity of different kinds of soils. And so all of these factors interact with one another to create a soil body or a soil entity that is truly unique. And as soils are forming, we think about four broad processes that lead to the formation of soils in the first place. And those are additions, things that are coming into the soil that could be plant material, material that has eroded from elsewhere, could be water, for example. The next one is translocations. As material is moving down through the soil, that we might think of that as a translocation, either aided by water or by burrowing organisms. Then there are transformations, which are chemical changes that might happen in the soil. Decomposition is a good example of a transformation, or the weathering of minerals into clay particles is another example of a transformation. And then of course, we also have losses. Things are removed from the soil in, by the aid of water or from erosion, for example. And so all of these soil forming processes, additions, losses, transformations, and translocations are creating these unique soil entities that we see out in the world. And these processes are happening all the time. Soils are dynamic both across space, they vary depending on where you are in a given landscape, but they also change and develop and form over time. And soil scientists are interested in understanding that trajectory, how a soil changes or is transformed over a given period of time and what the implications are for the functioning of that soil, for the ability of that soil to provide these important ecosystem services. These are two completely different soils here. The soil at the top is, uh, I think that's a soil in Virginia. You can see that there is pretty shallow soil that has this bedrock right underneath it. The soil underneath is one that's forming in uh, landscape in Alaska. You can see it's a lot wetter. There's a thick ice layer or permafrost at the bottom of this soil. These are just two examples of how soils vary quite a bit across different places and also in different times. And those soil forming factors that I mentioned, in addition, combination with the processes, additions, losses, transformations, and translocations lead to this great diversity that we see in our soils. And so soil scientists study this diversity of different soil forms and functions through what we call the soil profile. The soil profile is a straight on view. If you were to cut a hole in the ground, dig a hole in the ground, uh, you would be looking at a soil profile. So it is the straight on view of the layers or what we call horizons of a given soil. So this is an image of a soil that is forming in the floodplain of the Mississippi River. You can see that there are distinct different colors and features in these layers, or we call them horizons within the soil. And then the other figure here shows you a schematic of how a given soil profile might fit within a landscape. And so soil scientists will go out and, and study the soil profile and then make interpretations about that soil profile based on the overall context of the landscape within which it exists. Because even though we're looking at one little sliver of a soil down through the depth uh, from the surface, soils are continuous. They're continuous with depth vertically. They're also continuous laterally. And they exist in a three-dimensional space as well. And so when we're thinking about an overall soil, it's not just what we can see exposed at the surface but also how that soil interacts deeper down into the profile and also across a landscape as well. And when we're trying to understand how soils form and function across a larger scale, we wanna be able to study multiple different soil profiles out uh, in the field at different points within a landscape to be able to make an interpretation about a big picture. 
So what I want to do today is show you a couple of the clues, a couple of the features that we're looking for as soil scientists when we go up to a new soil profile. I often tell my students that every time you dig a hole is an opportunity to learn something new. Every single time that I approach a new soil, even if it's one that I've studied before, even if it's a soil friend that I have visited over and over, I always find something new because soils are these heterogeneous parts of nature that every time you go back in a different season, a different time of day, the lighting might be different. You might notice something else. There's always something new to discover, even in a soil that you have spent quite a bit of time with. And so from a scientific perspective, soil scientists go out to a soil profile like these here. These are two soil profiles from Arctic Alaska. And we will identify where the horizons are, and then we will make measurements, both in the field and in the laboratory, to characterize the physical, chemical, and biological properties of those soils. And you can see that sometimes figuring out where the horizons are is maybe a little bit simpler, like this shallower soil. You can see, I don't know if you can see those little white dots, those are um, and those are golf tees that we have pushed into the soil profile to differentiate where these horizons are. And in that soil over there, it's very, you know, horizons that are changing down through the soil profile. But in other soils, like this permafrost impacted soil in Arctic Alaska, sometimes soils are mixing together. This is through the process of cryoturbation, where freeze-thaw cycles have mixed this material around. Um, and so the horizons aren't as easy to differentiate. And so soil scientists will use clues, like the color, for example, to figure out how the properties of a given soil change. And from those clues, we can expand our investigation to make interpretations about whether that soil would be productive for agriculture or how that soil might respond to a given kind of management or whether that soil is susceptible to change from climate change. We can make so many interpretations once we have looked at the physical chemical and biological properties within the soil. And I want to give you a few examples of things that you might be able to notice when you find soils out in your in your day to day life. And so the first one and probably the most striking of the features of the soil is the color. It's probably the first thing that I notice when I walk up to a new soil, I notice the color and often the color can tell us something about the properties of that soil the colors. It range from everything from browns. There are many different kinds of browns and soil scientists love to categorize lots of different kinds of browns, but there are also soils that are yellow and orange and red and gray and all of the colors in between. And that color, the color of the soil often tells us what kinds of minerals are, uh, are derived that so from which that soil is derived. It can also tell us the condition, the overall condition of the soil. So for example, the soil that is in my hand in this photo here, the reason that it has these different colors is because it's been saturated by water for a long period of time. And under those water saturated conditions, there are oxidation and reduction reactions, chemical reactions that happen that transform iron into two different kinds that create these different colors, like the rusty red color that you see there. And so we can use the color as, as a clue for the kinds of material that that soil comes from, but also the, the condition or the, the, the status of that soil. The other photo here shows this little booklet sitting on the surface of a soil. This is a very sandy soil that has thin bands of clay. These are called lamellae. Side notes, one of my favorite below ground features out here in the coast. And these lamellae are thin bands of clay and you can see that they have a distinctly different color. And the color helps us understand that, that, that something different is going on in those little bands of clay uh, compared to what's happening in the otherwise sandy soil. And this little booklet sitting on the top here is called the Munsell Color Book. And those are little chips of color that we match the soil that we see out in the field with the appropriate color. And we can uh, make an estimation of what the color is that way. And that makes it easier for us to compare to other soil colors of other soils that we might be studying. 
And like I mentioned, soils come in a huge variety of different colors. This is one of the things that I became so drawn to when I first learned about soils. Before I took a soils class, I didn't know that soils were so many different colors, yellow and pink. Pink is my favorite color. And when I learned that there were pink soils out there in the world, I just couldn't help myself. Um, and I have been you know, really enamored by the colors of soils ever since. And just knowing something about the color of the soil can really tell you a lot. Here's some examples of common pigmenting agents in soil. You can see that there are lots of different kinds of minerals that give rise to different colors like quartz and glauconite and gypsum. All of these minerals are pigmenting agents that give the soils the color that they are. And so if we know something about the color of the soil, we can figure out what kinds of minerals might be present in that soil, even before we take them back into the laboratory and do some tests to figure out what kinds of minerals are there. So color is something that not only makes soil beautiful, but it's also a really useful tool, a diagnostic tool to help us make interpretations about how a soil formed and uh, how it might respond to changes in the environment. The next feature of soil is the shape or what we call the structure of the soil. So if you have been, you know, spent some time digging around in soils out in your garden, you may have noticed that sometimes soils are very crumbly and what we call granular, easy to dig through. They have a porous structure that allows plant roots, like in this photo here, to be able to, you know, exist and move through that surface horizon of the soil. That's an example of soil structure. What is the natural shape? What is the natural aggregation? And in which soil particles form. Other soils that have higher clay content, for example, might form into different kinds of structure. You can see these blocky shapes of soil structure that's naturally forming in the subsoil of a given soil because it has a lot more clays. And clays are sticky. They stick to one another and they create these different shapes or forms within the soil. And sometimes we're even lucky enough to pull some soil love like this heart out of the soil directly. And so knowing something about the shape or structure of the soil can help us understand how soil uh, interacts with the rest of its environment. So for example, if as water is moving through the soil environment, it is influenced by the structure, the amount of airspace versus the amount of uh, soil particles that are kind of cemented or glued together that influences how water moves through the soil environment. So knowing something about the structure can also tell us something about how that soil formed, but also about how it interacts with the rest of the environment. And the next one is the soil texture. So as some of you may know, soils are composed of three main components. There is sand particles that are our largest particles, silt particles, which are somewhere in the middle, they feel very smooth and buttery, and clay particles, which are tiny little sheet-like particles that you can see in these electron microscope images on the bottom here, that uh, all three together create different kinds of soil textures. And soil texture arises from the weathering of different kinds of rocks and minerals. And so the reason that we see soils that are sandy or soils that are clayey or somewhere in the middle uh, is because of the diversity of different kinds of rocks and materials that soils are weathering from. So soil scientists will estimate the soil texture in the field with our hands, but we'll also take samples back into the lab and estimate the soil texture from there. The last thing that you will likely come across when you're looking out at soils in your day-to-day -day life are the kinds of rocks and what we call rock fragments and how they are organized within the soil profile. This is an example of an, of an alluvial soil which has been moved from material higher up in, uh, in a watershed by the aid of water. And because this soil and these rocks have been deposited by water, you can see not only that they're well stratified, there's this clear layer of larger rocks, and then there are some smaller rocks above, and then there's even a little sandy layer right underneath that larger boulder at the top. You can see that there are these clear horizons, or there's a stratification of the different kinds of rocks because they've been moved and deposited sequentially by water. Because these rocks have also been moved by water, they are rounded, and that's one of the 
features that we can use as evidence to say, okay, this soil probably got here by the aid of water. When rock fragments are a lot more craggy and broken and not well sorted, that might mean that the material was moved by gravity and is just kind of tumbling down the hill and the soil is forming from there. And so we can use clues about the kinds of rocks, but also the formation or the structure, the morphology of those rocks, what those rocks look like to infer not just the parent material, the original, original material from which that soil formed, but also how that material got there in the first place. And so this is a this is a soil from out in Colorado, and I loved it so much that I transferred it into my sketchbook. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that artistic practice in just a minute. So to recap, some of the features that you can look for are the color of the soil, the shape and the structure, the different kinds of horizons or layers within the soil, the texture, is it very sticky, is it sandy and gritty, is it smooth, and also the kinds of rocks and the nature of the distribution of the rocks within a soil profile. And you can imagine that just across these four or five morphological features that I've, that I've introduced to you, there's a huge variety of different soils that you might be able to find out in the world. And every single soil that you encounter has a unique story to tell. There are no two soils that are exactly alike. There are soils that have similar features. There are soils that have formed through similar processes. For example, soils that are in a similar climate, for example, may have similar features, but every single soil has a unique story to tell because of the history of that site and exactly where it is within a landscape influences how these soil forming factors and the processes of soil formation lead to all of these different types of soils that we see out in the world. And like I've mentioned, soils are all around us. And so at any time that you're outside, whether you're in an urban setting, whether you're out in an open space, you can find soils all around you. And I want to give you five places to go look for soils in your day to day life. I am the kind of person that is always looking for soils. I tell people that I see soils or excuse me, I see the world through a soils lens. It's like I'm wearing soil glasses all the time. I can't help myself but look for them all around when I'm driving, when I'm walking on my bike, no matter where I am on the bus, I'm always looking out the window, looking for soils. And I wanna tell you where I look to find soils exposed naturally. Because one of the things that's challenging about soils, and I think one of the reason that many of us haven't seen or noticed soils as much is because they're below us. You know, often we need to dig a hole or we need to find places where they're naturally exposed before we can actually see some of these features. They're hidden from view uh, by the plants and the ecosystems and landscapes that exist above them. And so the first place to look for soils is always look where water flows. If you live along the coast, often when I'm out at the beach, I look out at the ocean and I say, this is wonderful. And then I turn around and I look at the soils behind me. Because any time that water has flowed through a landscape, it often cuts through the soil and leaves exposures uh, that we can view and observe and explore. This is an example of a soil off the coast of California here where I live. And this is along the coast. And so this soil is exposed from the combined process of wave action coming in and eroding away some of that material and also rainwater and water coming down through a runoff and through kind of a, a drainage area. And that's why you see some of the soil exposed. If you're ever walking past a river or a stream, that's a great place to look for soils. If you're out on a lake or you're out fishing, anytime where there's a water body, anytime where you notice water movement is a good place to look for naturally exposed soils. And you can see that this is, you know, a soil profile. We've got this darker surface horizon that's darker because of the enrichment with organic matter. And then we have some lighter horizons underneath. And we didn't have to dig a hole to be able to see this. We were just able to find it naturally exposed in the environment. Another place, particularly if you live in an urban or suburban area, are construction sites. I am also the person that is pulling over on the side of the road to a construction site and peeking my eyes through the fence and seeing what I can find. 
often uh, construction efforts will reveal soils in new ways that uh, that aren't naturally exposed or that you couldn't do with a shovel because they're using larger equipment to be able to dig these big holes. So I'm always telling my students to stop by at a construction site. I they actually are building a new building on campus here where at the university where I work and it had one of the fun parts about watching this building go up is uh, seeing the groundworks and seeing the soil that has been exposed in that natural area. And sometimes, especially in urban environments, the differentiation between features within a soil is really complex because material in urban soils has often been moved from elsewhere and filled into a given place to support our construction efforts. And so construction zones are often great places to see soil exposures, but you have to look the first time because they often get filled in again as the construction continues. Another great place to look for soils is along trails and roads. Anytime that a road or a trail has cut through soil material. This is an example of a trail along one of our boardwalk open spaces here in the county. This darker surface horizon is actually fill material from when they dredged a marina and deposit it on top of the surface here to create a trail for uh, recreation. And so anytime you're out on a trail or walking on the sidewalk, you may notice that soils are exposed because of our uh, trail and road building efforts have cut through, physically cut through the soil landscape. Other times, soil just naturally erodes away along hillsides. So you may find that there are some natural slumps or drainage ways where soils might be exposed. Uh, just from the process of gravity and erosion, particularly on steeper slopes. This is a soil in Colorado that was just naturally exposed along a hillside. I was going on a hike out there and I noticed it, always stopped to take a picture and uh, was able to kind of explore it that way. So once you have the eyes to be able to see soils, it's like you can't unsee them, right? And I, I'm always looking for, for new places. The, the last one, the fifth place that I suggest to look for soils is anytime someone digs a hole. So whether you're doing a project in your backyard, maybe you're establishing a new garden bed, or maybe you're doing some kind of project in the yard. If you're digging a hole, this is an opportunity for you to learn something new about the soil and make observations and explore and interact with that soil. They're also, uh, I, I, I am the kind of person that when people are doing things in their yard and they, they know they're going to end up having to dig a hole, I get the call. I say, do you want to come by? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm digging a hole out at this site. And so anytime that someone digs a hole is, is an opportunity to learn about soils. And that's true for humans. That's also true for organisms. You know, there are larger organisms that dig down through the soil whether that be badgers, for example, or other ground dwelling organisms that might dig a larger hole and you can see some natural exposures there as well. So I wanna spend the last couple of minutes here sharing a little bit about how I've gone from understanding soils from a scientific perspective to integrating art as part of my practice. And so for me, I have found that creating art, whether that be drawing or painting, is really a practice in observation. And so much of what we do as soil scientists is try to understand the soil properties by observing how they change and how they exist out in the world. We look at their color, texture, structure, all of those things, where soils are in the landscape. That requires a keen observation of the natural world. And creating art has allowed me to be able to continue to do that in a different way. So this is an example of a dune, coastal dune landscape here in San Luis Obispo County. And I spent some time with uh, my crayons, which are actually one of my favorite artistic medium, drawing the landscape. And in the process of doing this, I have to actually notice different things about where the soil is undulating, how it's changing, where the plants accumulate, where are they? How does that interact with water or different features within the soil? And by creating art has, has helped me be able to observe soils and landscapes in a different way. And I've realized that art, just like science, is a process, not necessarily just an outcome. 
the process of science is a way of coming to know the world. And in my case, I use science as a process to come to understand the natural world and the soils that exist within the natural world. And art is very much the same thing, where it's about creating the art. You know, much of the art that I share about soils, I share with other people and it's something that they can engage with. And I think that is great. If I have a painting and I'm able to show it with, to someone and that sets off some inspiration, I think that's wonderful. But I think even more important, it is to encourage other people to engage in the practice of science and also the practice of art. Because coming to know uh, soils from an artistic perspective has really changed my relationship or not necessarily changed, but expanded my relationship with soils beyond just my scientific perspective. And so what I've been doing in the last couple of years is collecting soil memories. And one way that I do that is by taking a glue stick and a little notebook and going out to these soils that I find in landscapes all across wherever I am and I'll make a little swatch. I'll put a swipe of glue stick and sprinkle some soil across. I'll notice where the horizons are and I'll be able to capture a soil memory from what I call my soil friends. <laughs> when I use the phrase soil friends, I mean soils that I'm going back to and visiting over and over again. The soil that I have here in my Zoom background is one of my soil friends on campus and uh, it's, it's one that I come back to very often. I will make a note here that while this is a very approachable technique, all you need is a glue stick and a piece of paper. It's important to always explore and collect soils responsibly. So make sure that you know where you are and that you are permitted to be able to collect soil from a given place. And also consider how those collections might impact the overall ecosystem and the, the land use at that site. And so for me, the diversity of different soil forms and functions that I've talked about today really inspires my artwork. And often I have been painting soil with soil where I've actually used watercolor paints that are derived from soils themselves to create soil art that represents a given soil out in the world. And so this is an example of what we call the Oreo soil. This is a grassland soil that we have here on Cal Poly's campus affectionately named the Oreo soil, maybe you can tell why, and uh, a painting that I made very early on in my uh, practice of, you know, exploring soils through an artistic approach. And now I often take reference photos when I go out to different kinds of sites, and then I will come back into my home studio and I'll create paintings from soil pigments and soil watercolors that represent that soil. And so many of my paintings are very realistic, you know, trying to represent what that soil looks like out in the world. And that's true for this beautiful soil exposure. This is one out in uh, Wyoming, in, uh, in Wyoming, in Laramie, Wyoming. And uh, I, this is one of my early, very, very early paintings that started it all. And I love this quote by Francis Hull that says, we are all temporarily not soil. And so by challenging myself to create art in a new way about a subject matter that I really love, it has expanded the way that I see soils out um, in my own day-to-day -day life. But often the art that I am creating is a lot more whimsical. And many of the soil paintings that I have created over the past several years don't actually represent a real soil that exists out in the world and rather try to evoke some kind of feeling about soils and express this diversity and wonder and color and and share my own curiosity about the soils themselves and so these are a few examples of the more whimsical end of some of my soil artwork that really is about engaging this feeling of soils as being this natural wonder out in the world. And just like all things, soils take time to develop. And our practice of getting to know soils is an ongoing conversation. It's something that I will continue to do for the rest of my career and life. Getting to know the soils in your local landscapes is something that doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to develop in the same way that a given soil profile takes time to develop and weather and change. 
This is one of a, a digital design that I've created and I just love it. Good things take time to develop. And I hope that today this has inspired you to take another look at soils when you are out in your day-to-day -day life and think about how that huge diversity of soils out in the world gives rise to the diversity within the natural world. And so I think very often we ask ourselves, what can soils do for us? But I wanna challenge you and encourage you to also think what can soils teach us? What can soils teach us about the natural world and our place within it? How can soils help us understand nature? How can we go beyond just thinking about what soils can do for us, but really thinking about how soils can be this wonderful part of the natural world? And so with that, I thank you for spending a little bit of time celebrating soil with me. I really appreciate the invitation from the Smithsonian Gardens to be here. I also wanna give a huge shout out and thank you to the If Then initiative that has given so many opportunities for me and others to share my passion about my discipline and really contributed to a culture shift in understanding how everyone, especially women and young girls can be involved in science and art and technology. If you wanna keep up with me, you can follow me on Instagram at Wonder of Soil. I also recently started streaming on Twitch where I will paint and draw in my home studio. I also do nature streams where I go out to a beautiful landscape and I will draw or paint uh, out in the field. And so if you're interested, you can look me up on there. You can also find my website, yuminapressler.com or visit fortheloveofsoil.org, our soil science education, communication and art organization that celebrates all things soils. You can find us on Instagram and also on the web. I appreciate you all being here and I welcome questions. Thank you, Dr. Pressler. That is so fascinating. I love the last picture. This is absolutely beautiful. And I can see why you're attracted to soils because of the color. Uh, a great appreciation of the artistic side of something we see very often. I have fond memories of driving along the road and seeing the road cuts. and. I'm yeah. always afraid that I'm going to have an accident because I get so distracted. <laughs> I should okay, stop. Good. I'm I should not the stop. only one. <laughs> so a warning, please stop before you look at the soils. <laughs> yes. But right. before we answer some of the questions that have come into the chat box, I wanted to share um, a little bit of information about why we have you here today on our uh, Let's Talk Gardens webinar. Because this is, you alluded to it with the If Then uh, logo that's here on the slide, but this is an amazing opportunity that the Smithsonian has created for our visitors. And if you stop sharing, I was gonna share the screen, if I can, um, of some slides that were given to me by James Gagliardi, one of our horticulturists uh, that's in the hop garden right now. And this is a special project that is appearing in the hop garden for the next couple days. There will be education material and education programs in the arts and industry building this weekend, both Saturday and Sunday. Well, Smithsonian Gardens will have representatives there talking about uh, the different topics that goes along. And I also want everybody to know that these the the next three days are the only time that you're going to be able to see these sculptures in the hopped garden because then they are split up and they're going to be moved around to all the museums at the smithsonian or many of the museums at the smithsonian so this one little clip that james shared with us i think you may recognize the sculpture that's above the dolly so let me be quiet and i'll share this with you maybe so if you recognize the person in this orange sculpture dr pressler thank you for being part of this project and thank you for inspiring so many people young women whoever to be able to explore the science and the art side of soils do you want to tell us a little bit about how i'll stop sharing this and like I said, this will be in the Enid A. Haupt Garden. This is part of the 
if then she can exhibit that's going on for the next month the whole month of march march is a celebration of women in all fields but of course we're highlighting science and art in this one so if you would tell us a little bit more about how you got involved in this and what has meant to you in your life are you muted yes you are it's probably because whenever i switch off okay there see if you can unmute now sorry there. i muted myself i didn't realize i would okay stuck there Yes, thanks so much for sharing about the exhibit. It is so surreal to see myself in statue form, <laughs> wielding my shovel. I just absolutely love it. Being part of this initiative and the exhibit is so incredibly meaningful for me because, you know, before I started studying soils, I had no idea what a soil scientist was. And I, I remember when I told my dad that I wanted to become a soil scientist, he said, that's a job. That's a thing that you can do. <laughs> And, you know, for me, it's a real opportunity to celebrate our discipline and how, how fun it is to be able to think about soils from both the scientific and artistic perspective. I, has, I have especially appreciated how supportive the If Then initiative and group has been of my efforts to integrate science and art together. And uh, the opportunities to be able to share that with so many people, share my passion, and particularly think about how we can inspire the next generation of soil scientists, the next generation of artists, the next generation of naturalists, people that are excited about nature and protecting and conserving it is something that is so core to my mission. And this has been a really exciting time to be able to do that. I agree. So again, it is a special exhibit in the Enid A. Haupt Garden, which is part of Smithsonian Gardens, of course, uh, for the next three days. Please go down tomorrow or Saturday and Sunday and enjoy these. I think there's 112 or 120 sculptures. And James, I apologize, my numbers I can't remember. Uh, but they'll be placed around the garden. And they're all orange because that's what the creator of this exhibit, his favorite color is. So, and they're all 3D uh, um, uh, digitally created um, um, sculptures. So what a great way to excite people about learning more about science and art. Uh, science on, on, uh, in art, in your case, others are just scientists, so you can read about them. You can also visit the exhibit on the main Smithsonian webpage, not Smithsonian Gardens, but the main Smithsonian webpage. What we're featuring on our webpage is the orchid exhibit, which is still going on at the Kogod Courtyard downtown uh, in the, the courtyard is between the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the National Portrait Gallery, a beautiful space made even more beautiful right now and more fragrant with all the artistic displays of orchids and you'll also be able to find out more about women in orchidology during that again the science and art of orchids between art illustrations botanical illustrations and scientists that are working in the field of orchidology so now those are not commercials but we, we get so excited about what we're doing. Uh, we get so excited about all the opportunities that the Smithsonian and Smithsonian Gardens offers. We have to share them with you. So I'm going to go to the questions now. How can we preserve soil given the widespread level of construction in cities that does not preserve or protect soil? This is a great question. I think it came from Teresa. I appreciate you asking this. And I, I think that one of the first steps is to continue to have conversations about soils and thinking about the impact of all of our human activities on the soil environment. I think very often we're focused on aspects that occur above ground and soils are seen as a tool or a medium to aid you know, some of our construction efforts or our expansion and, and not often framed as a natural part of, uh, or a part of nature itself. And so I think that really the first step is exactly what we're doing here, having conversations about soils and, and thinking about how we can reframe them as being an important part of nature because of those important ecosystem services that it provides. 
But there are lots of things that you can do. And particularly, I know in this audience, there are a lot of gardeners out there. I think celebrating the soil in your own backyard is something that is really, really important. And getting to know the soils in your local parks or open spaces or wherever you might be and uh, talking to other people about that is really the first step. You know, being engaged, especially in local and um, you know, local activism or local politics around what kinds of construction is happening and where and why and how to preserve our open spaces, I think is probably the best way to do that. Being engaged in a local community and bringing soils as part of that conversation, I, I think is a really important first step. And as more of us start to have the eyes and also the language to be able to talk about and see soils, I, I'm hopeful that our, our perspectives will start to shift and we'll be able to preserve and protect soils on a broader scale. That sounds exactly what we talk about with plants. There's plant bl blindness, there's soil blindness. It's about time that people start to make more observations and look at the natural world around them and how we're impacting them in our urban areas and suburban areas. Of course, our rural areas as well for farming and what the agricultural world is doing to soil. So, so many different ways to be able to look at a subject. In fact, as an educator, I love this question. Do you see a growing interest in incorporating mixed methods and creative practice within the soil science community? Should more soil science programs, for example, incorporate more mixed methods from the humanities and social sciences? I also, as an educator, love this question. And, you know, I think I can speak from my own personal experience that expanding into this artistic space, and I also do a lot of writing, has helped me think about soils in a different way. And I talk about art and writing as processes. You know, we often think about writing in particular as like a, as a communication tool. But for students, it's, it's really a process of learning of coming to understand not just for students really for anyone and mm -hmm. I think that art is the same way and so that's certainly something that I have begun to experiment with in my own soil science classes and I have been met with much enthusiasm from the greater soil science community there are many examples of soil scientists that are working at this art and soil interface and I think that is certainly uh, something that has been celebrated within our own discipline However, one of the challenges with teaching soils is that, like I said, soils are this integrative part of the natural world. And so to understand soils, not only do you need to understand something about geology, but you need to know something about chemistry, biology, physics, you know, politics, economics, all mm -hmm. the things, you know, if we're thinking about managing soils. And that's a big task, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that art and writing and some of these creative aspects have a really important role for helping bring students that um, maybe are not, or may, might be intimidated by the more scientific or technical aspects of the discipline to show them that there's so many different ways that you can participate in thinking about soils and really use art and communications and, and the humanities as a mechanism to help us explore soils in new ways. So I would say yes, um, and that's that's certainly something we're actively thinking about how we can do more of, but it comes certainly with a challenge of this integrative nature of soils and, and how do we, you know, what I, I will I will spend my entire life studying soils and there is still so much more to know, right? And so so how do we make it approachable and, and give students and people the tools to be able to have conversations about soils um, but also allow them to kind of see the big picture. And I think that art has a, has a big, um, has a big role there. Bravo. I agree with you. Bravo. Um, okay. Now more technical question. Can you speak a little on soil pH and the effect microbes and larger critters in the soil have on it? So you mentioned that mm -hmm. maybe a resource that we can follow because we only have two minutes left. Sure, that's a great question. So I um, I can put a resource in the chat here in general. Terrific. For the love of swell.org slash educate. Um, so 
At the beginning of the pandemic, a couple of colleagues of mine and I put together an education page on fortheloveofsoil.org that has a lot of uh, materials across all kinds of different subdisciplines within soil science. This was meant for educators to help us as we were transitioning into teaching in an online format, but I also think it's a great resource. There are a lot of different uh, videos and photos and slides and all kinds of things that you can explore. But to get at your question of soil pH, it's an interesting one because soils, as they develop and become more and more weathered, they tend to get more acidic over time. Mm -hmm. And many of the reactions that lead to this acidification of the soil environment are biologically mediated. And so microorganisms like nitrifiers, for example, mm -hmm. that uh, lead to the process of nitrification, that's an acidifying process. And there's also uh, reactions with CO2 that's occurring in the soil that lead to the acidification of the soil environment and that CO2 originates from the microorganisms themselves. And so there is a big microbial role in changing the pH of the soil environment, uh, particularly when you think about soils uh, weathering and changing over long periods of time. Yes. And I, I wish I could talk more with you <laughs> about uh, interpreting some pH in your own garden. I hope we can do that at some point. I think we should. I think this, we have so many speakers that one session is just not enough to be able to get into. <laughs> so you would definitely be asked back. Thank you so Thank much. You. One quick question. And I know lots of people in the audience, I always wondered this too, especially when I was a kid. What makes the little holes in the soil like behind you in your in your friend's soil right here? Oh, yeah, there there are lots of organisms that uh, live within the soil that these burrows, it might be from a larger organism like a badger, but I think it's probably from a ground squirrel given the site. Here in California in our grasslands, we have a whole bunch of ground squirrels. We also have burrowing owls. You know, if you're if you're looking along a stream cut, you might see some little burrows. Those could come from birds that are you know nesting like a kingfisher for example that might or a swallow that might nest in the banks of streams so there are birds there are other organisms that create these burrows and and sometimes what's cool is there's a there's a there's a process that happens where those animal burrows sometimes will become filled with soil material from mm -hmm, the surface mm -hmm. And so sometimes you can actually find a soil profile that doesn't have an active burrow in it, but you can see the evidence that there was a burrow previously and that material had come in from the surface. So it's a way that soil material from the surface gets mixed in to the rest of the soil environment through the action of the organisms that live within the soil. So I'm not even sure exactly where that one come from. It could have been also a larger rock was there yeah. and it fell out and yeah. made that hole. Um, yeah. But I know we have a lot of ground squirrels in this area, so it's probably a little bit of both. Your, your last answer is one my son, the geologist, always tells me, Mom, a rock just fell out of there and get over it. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say thank you so much. This has been delightful, and we really appreciate your observational skills and your interpretation of what's going on around us and underneath our, our feet. Thank so. you so much for for celebrating soil with us today. I really appreciate it and hope to be back. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pressler. And and we'll we'll salute you every time we walk through the hopped garden. <laughs> yes. All right, good. All Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>